Okay, we're going to get started. All right, so we're getting back into morphing. And we're going to be covering morphing and just thinking out your motion and animation hierarchy. I drew these shapes real quick and rude. Um, I, I knocked out this entire thought in 15 minutes. So here's what I did. I wanted to morph from a spaceship to a tree. Okay. So that's my first thought. I got two similar shapes, lined them up, and had them turn into each other. Then to give it some life, I added some fire to the spacecraft, parented that to the spacecraft, and used the colorama effect to color it over time. And then as the morph was happening, I added some bend to the tree to give it some extra life to the motion as the bird flies off of it. So it's really two separate morphs happening. The ship, that's why I kept in two colors. The ship morphs into the tree and the window on the ship morphs into the bird. OK, so can everyone visually see what I did there? And I'm going to break it down step by step. I'm just showing you a thought because first I drew the, the ship. I'm like, that's boring. So I added life to it by moving it in to the shot. And I'm like, well, it would look better if I added some flame coming out of it. And I'm like, well, I got a little bit of time. So I drew a quick cockpit that morphs into the bird, which is what causes the rustling of the tree as it flies away. So I thought through an idea and I pushed it and pushed it until I have this final concept. OK, so like I said, that was just 15 minutes worth of work, very crudely drawn out. But it's a very complex idea where everything is motivated by something else in the scene. OK, so here is the basics of it. So the tween, the computer automatically does your work for you. Morphing, you've got to plan out everything and it's got to make sense. So I'll show you what that looks like. I'll draw, I'll use a stroke, no fill. I just did the fill set. You can see it works with both strokes and fills. A spoon into a fork. We'll just do something like that, okay? That visually makes sense because you eat with both of them, got it? So whenever you're doing your morph, or your tween, you really don't want it to move around unless you plan to and it's got to look deliberate or people are going to think you don't know what you're doing. So I'm going to start at the bottom because they'll both have a similar handle and they'll change up at the top. So I'm going to start here and I'm just going to draw this out real quick. Uh, I'm going to start with the fork first because that'll give me enough points. Now, nah, let's let's try the spoon first, just for the sake of being interesting. I'm drawing enough points. Normally, you want to have as few points as possible. But uh, I know off the bat, my fork is going to need a lot of points. OK, so I drew it. It's still selected. I'm going to call this my first vertex point um, where this is going to start off as. And I'm going to make it sure it's the same with both shapes. So I right clicked. I had that one point selected, right clicked, mask, shape and path. Set first vertex. And now that I got that out of the way, I can clean this up just a tiny bit. So it reads more as a spoon. A little better. Nothing to write home about. OK, world's greatest spoon. So. I'm going to go to my path and click the stopwatch. 
paths hold a lot of information. So this is going to hold the shape plus the first vertex point. I'll name it. I click off. I'm going to draw a completely different shape because I'm going to need a second path point. I'm going to line up again with where the first one was. And again, I'm just doing this fast because no one's here to watch me draw. You're here to learn the concepts of motion. Got my fork. Let me hide this. I'm clicking on the path to have the path selected. If I hold down shift, I can click on a point. So I have just that one selected. Same one as before. Right click, mask shape and path, set first vertex. Now I make my keyframe. So if I hit the U key, I've got two layers, fork and spoon, and a path point for each. And both have the first vertex coming out of the first bottom corner. The shapes are roughly the same size. So I lined them up like that. Is everybody with me so far? OK, so I thought of some similar shapes that are tied to a theme, eating utensils. So it's going to make sense. Now, the very beginning of this course, I said, I want you to think of a shape layer as an empty salad bowl, like a solid layer. You could throw effects on it. You could use it for color. Fine. Shape layers are far more robust and they always will be. You could always add new stuff by going here. So I'm going to go layer new, shape layer. And you go, well, why didn't you just start drawing something? Because that's not how we're rolling tonight. I have an empty shape layer, just like my empty salad bowl going up to the buffet. Everyone got that concept. It's a shape layer with nothing in it. It's like a placeholder. Okay. There's nothing there. OK, so now I've got to add something, which means add. And you can do that with the selection arrow or your shape tool selected. I'm going to add a path. So now I have an empty path with nothing there. I'm going to name this morph so I know what it is. I'm going from a spoon to a fork. So I've got a keyframe in this layer. All I have to do now is copy the keyframe from my spoon, paste it onto that, and I say how fast do I want this morph to be. Let's just say around a second. I'm going to click my empty diamond to add a second keyframe. Now I'm going to copy and paste my fork keyframe into there. And I can hide these because I'm done with them for now. Don't freak out. It's an empty layer. So I added a path. I filled the path. So now I'm going to add. I could do a fill. Let's do a fill for this. You know what? Let's even kick it up a notch. Do a gradient fill. Why not? And I can edit it here. By clicking edit. I should be able to edit that gradient better with the tools, but I'm not finding them at the moment. So I'll just use it manually. OK. And I'll just put a white solid behind. Eh, light blue, why not? OK. So when I hit the space bar, there's our morph. From one shape to the next. Now, what were to have happened if instead of that first corner, I try here. So if I go right click, set first vertex, go here, right click, ask and path, set first vertex. Let's see if we get a different motion. Now it's moving a little bit better because it's just calculating from up there. See, 
a little bit smoother. I thought through where I wanted my motion to come from, changed it. There you go. Any questions on that? Nope. So if I wanted to go to a knife, I'd add another layer. And then add a path point to it. But first, before I click that, I'll set that as my first vertex. Now I can grab that. So I hit copy. I can hide that, go to my morph, choose where I want it to pop in, paste it in there. Now I've got all three utensils. And the morph moves a little bit with the spoon. I mean, with the knife. Just because of the number of path points that are happening. So that's something I could try and tweak later on if I wanted to, but... Everyone good with that concept? Yeah. Motion design is all about trying to keep the viewer's eye in the same spot. That's why this these first two are so successful. And they're tied together. Just like when I did this, <clears throat> the whole idea makes sense. And it's, there's like barely any, uh, movement between the two morphs it's a it's very successful and you just got to think if you've got multiple objects that you want to morph into an idea the window of the plane is parented to the plane and the morph the first morph is the plane and the tree the second morph is the window into the bird i had to get rid of this window somehow because there's not going to be a window on the tree so that was my solution. Turn it into a bird, have a flyway, which causes the shaking of the tree. So thinking out your animation hierarchy, your information hierarchy, planning out your idea. And like I said, this first one took me about 15 minutes before class started. And if I dialed in my artwork, it'd be even more successful. But I just wanted to show you, you can morph multiple shapes into multiple shape layers and still get an idea that makes sense. Okay, does anyone have any questions on that? I'll give these out after class. Okay, so you saw how shape paths hold a lot of detail, like first vertex, the color and the shape information. Now we're going to dive back into masks and we'll finish up the photomorph. Let's see if I still have the images from the first one. All right, looks like I deleted them, so I'll get them again. Here's my catch up. I just did MW underscore. There's my tomato. Okay, so I'll import those.
And just a reminder, these are one to one ratios so that when I scale them both down, they're going to be the same scale. If they're not the same scale, your morph will get all messed up. They're one to one for each other. They're a little bit similar where they've got curves at the top and near the bottom. And as I said before, a tomato is used to make ketchup. So this morph makes sense. Everyone with me on that point so far? Okay. Now, I'm going to click the ketchup bottle first. I think it's layer auto trace. Let's see if I'm right. Yeah. Okay. It's going to work off of the alpha. And there's normally, I do not want to apply to a new layer. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to hit M. Oh, wait, it's the ketchup bottle. Yeah, M. There's right there. I'm going to name this ketchup. And I know I misspelled my art. I don't care. And I misspelled the mask. I don't care. This isn't spelling. It's motion design. Okay, so watch what happens this time. I select my tomato. Layer, auto trace. I'm not creating a new layer. I hit M. I've got three masks and they're different colors because of how these leaves respond. Right here, the pink one, mask two. I don't need that. So you can only mask between one mask at a, you can only morph between one mask at a time. And that's that one right there. So I'm just selecting it and hitting backspace. So now I've got my tomato mask. I hit my U key, so I've got a keyframe for each path that I've named. Everyone got that so far? Yeah. All right, one mask, one mask. And you already know we're going to be morphing this. So in order to do that, we need an effect. And it's called... Uh, Reshape. Whew. I forgot what it was, but I found it. I knew it would be under distort because I'm distorting images. So sometimes when you can't remember something, just go to the general category. I'm going to throw it on the ketchup bottle. Okay. Where did... Where did all my stuff go? Wait a second. There's my tomato. Okay. Good. So I'm going to hit my U keys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select my ketchup mask, hit copy, paste on here. So there's two masks. Then I'm going to grab my ketchup mask, copy it. Oh, wait a second. So my tomato has tomato and ketchup. So I'm going to copy my tomato and paste it onto the ketchup. Okay. Each one has both masks. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay. For my tomato, I'm going to set the tomato to add and the ketchup to none. And then for my ketchup, I'm going to set the ketchup to add and the tomato to none. What this is going to do is it's going to say, take the photo of the ketchup and the shape of the tomato and the opposite up here, the photo of the tomato and the shape of the ketchup. So one's going to be add when you want to use the photo and the shape you want to switch to will be set to none. Photo of the tomato, shape of the ketchup, photo of the ketchup, shape of the tomato. OK. Everyone with me? 
Okay. I'm going to throw reshape onto my tomato. I can hide this for now. So I've got my tomato selected and the reshape effect is here. The source, I'm on the tomato. The source is the tomato. What it's turning into, it's turning into the ketchup. Now watch what happens when I slide the percentage slider. It's turning into the bottle of ketchup. Okay. So without any further work, that's pretty decent. But we're always here to push our ideas. I'll lower my resolution. Now, elasticity. I'm going to want it to be loose. So when I morph up, it's going to be a little bit more organic. Interpolation method, I'm going to do linear. So it's a constant speed. Now, Can everybody see this line? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. I'm going to magnify so you can see my mouse better. This next part is everything. Okay. I'm hovering over here. Nothing changes. You see my mouse is just an arrow, correct? Yeah. Now, this circle with the line is a correspondence point. Second I get to it, I now have a circle by my arrowhead. Can everybody see that? No arrow, no circle, circle by my arrowhead. Is everyone seeing that? That lets me know I'm hovered over and going to move a correspondence point, not a mask point. You only want to move correspondence points, okay? Like I just did there. So, I'm going to go back to normal view. What that means... So I know some of you are like, what are you talking about? I'm going to pick similar. Come on. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to pick shapes and areas that are a little bit more similar. So there's the circle. There's my correspondence point. I'm going to roughly go to about the top of that curve on the tomato. There's my correspondence point to about the top of that curve. So I'm going from a curve to a curve. Okay. If it doesn't work, I can always just hit undo. Now, if you want to add more correspondence points, here's how you do it. Well, do this slowly. And if anyone has a question, stop me right away. When you're in between mask points, and you hold down Alt or Option, you add a correspondence point. You have to be in between mask path points. Hold down Alt or Option and click. Does everybody have that? If you go moving your path points, you'll mess up the mask. And I'm just going to move this here. So I'm going from a top corner to a top corner. Everybody all right with that? Yeah. So I can add as many correspondence points, say, go from this corner to that corner, or, you know, like that curved corner to that curved corner. All I have to do, you just got to zoom in, because, like I said, you've got to be between mask path point. So I'll hold on alter option, click in between them. 
And then I just make sure I'm hovered over the circle to move the correspondence point. I'm going to do the same here. I'll do it right about here. I'm in between points. Hold down Alt. There's the circle letting me know I've got the correspondence point. Now I can zoom out. Again, the more correspondence points you have, the slower it'll be. If your correspondence points disappear, just re-click on the reshape effect over here in your panel. So let's take a look at this. I'm now going to click on the percent. And let's say I do a two second morph. And let's see our finished product of that first half of it. You to see my keyframes. See, there we go. Not bad. It didn't move around much and it did what we wanted to do. If I needed to rework anything, I would go back to my correspondence points. Any questions on that? No? Okay. You always want to get this perfect, okay? Because when I copy and paste my effect from the tomato onto the ketchup, it keeps my correspondence points and everything else. So all I have to do now is for my transform, I'm not going from zero to 100, I'm going to go from 100 to zero. So let's see what that one looks like. It's going to go from the ketchup bottle. I should say the tomato shape to the ketchup shape. So they're both ending up at the ketchup shape. That's why the ketchup had to go backwards. So now I've got both of them. I'm going to make sure they line up. They look like they're lining up pretty good. I'll put the ketchup on top just to make it easier on myself. Now all I have to do is fade in the ketchup when I want it to. I could say from about here, Go forward a little bit. So I'm going to go from 0 to 100. And once I'm at that 100, oops, let me hit undo. I can just trim the layer below it so I don't have to worry about overlap. See, there's a little bit of a jump. Right there, so I could try, and it's, the mask was a little goofy. So let me move past that, just to have no drama in my life. Much better. I just changed where my morph faded in. Like such. So that's a little bit of troubleshooting as well. Like I said, if I were doing this professionally, I'd dial it in even more, but for this, I just wanted to show the idea of how path points hold so much more information with their mask path points and shape layer path points. Any questions? Okay. So, for the remaining bit of the lecture, I'm going to dive into what I thought we'd be tackling Tuesday, but I'm going to start it now. Letter morphing, which is going to be very useful if you're doing anything like this for your title sequence. Like I said, 
push your animation as far as you can. I'm going to use Ariel just because everybody's got Ariel. Or Ariel, however you say it, I don't care. Uh, let's pick a soothing color. My anchor point is at the bottom left corner, which is where I want it to be for this. That's important. I'm going to duplicate this by hitting Command D. And I'm going to make sure these are lined up as best they can be. I could always use a blending mode to see the overlap. And obviously, full res. There we go. That blending mode saved me a lot of work. I used hard mix. I've got a letter A and a letter B. Any questions so far? Nope. All right. Just a reminder, when you've got letters and text, you can right click, create, and you can get shapes or masks. I'm going to do shapes. There's my A. So I can now shy enable this because I don't need it. So I'm going to click shy enable here. Go to my switches and modes. The layer is already hidden. I click the shy icon and it's gone for my timeline. I can always get it back by clicking shy enable. This will help me save some space. I do the same thing for the B. Right click, create shapes from text. I'm going to shy this because I don't need it anymore. And there we go. I've got an A and I've got a B. Let's talk troubleshooting. There's the outside and then the negative space. So I'm going to label them so I don't get confused. See if I click here, I can see what's what. I just hit the enter key to rename it. I've got an outside and an inside. I'm going to click these just so I've got keyframes. And when I hit U, I've got a much smaller timeline now because this is why I want the path information. When I zoom in, it's saying this is my first vertex point for this one. I'm going to choose this corner instead because both shapes line up at the bottom left corner. I'm going to do the same thing here. Right click. Set first vertex. So both of these are the first vertex. Any questions on that so far? No. Okay. And there's the circle, first vertex. There's the circle, first vertex. I'm going to go down to my path here, and here's where we're going to have to strategize. For the B, there's three paths, outside, inside, inside, bottom. So let's see what's what. This one's my outside. And again, bottom left corner for all of these. Right click, set first vertex. This is the top one, as we can see. Right click, 
set first vertex to the bottom, hit enter to name it. This is the bottom one by default. Bottom left corner, hit enter to name it. Now I can hit the U key and all those layers are gone. So I've got just these, a nice tight timeline. Any questions on that so far? Okay. So I've got my paths. I've already set my first vertex. What's left? I create my empty shape layer for the morph. Layer, new, shape layer. I'll name it. It's empty, there's nothing in it. We're going to add a path. And I'm going to call this letter outside. I'm going to go to my contents. I'm going to add another path. Hit enter to name it. Letter inner top. Go back to my contents. Add another path. Enter to name it. Layer, inner, bottom. I'm going to click the paths for all these. So now I can hit my U key and I've only got my path layers selected. So I've got a nice clean timeline. I'm going to hit save. Any questions on that? Okay. So now the one disadvantage is I'm not seeing the names of my layers anymore. And let's see what happens when I click on them. Let me hide these. It's not really telling me. So I just closed the arrow here and opened it and now I see the full path. So that's a nice little shortcut. We'll try that here. See, that's working, but I've got a little bit more stuff here. Doesn't doesn't bother me. All right, outside. We're going to go from A to B. A outside. There's my path. Copy. Letter outside. Select it. Paste. And already you'll notice it moved. So I'm going to have to line that back up. Now I'm going to have to do that for everything I paste in. That's perfectly lined up. Now I'm going to go to my inside for the A. Copy my keyframe, letter inner top. Here's the keyframe for it on my morph layer. Paste it. Now I got to line it up again. That's lined up perfectly. So what I have to do now Just double check, make sure that my first vertex is there. I already see my first vertex is there, so I don't need to change that one. The inner shape, we're going to be dealing with Tuesday. Now we'll go to our letter B. I'm completely done with my A, so I can hide it. I've got all the details I need from it. B outside. I'm going to copy that. 
figure out where I want to go in my timeline. Let's say this is a two second morph. Outside, diamond to add a keyframe, paste it onto that keyframe. And now I just move it to line it up. And that's lined up perfectly. Now the inner top right here, copy that keyframe, go to my inner top on my morph layer, add a keyframe with the diamond button, select it, paste in the inner top path, line it back up. I'm using the arrow keys with the full path selected to do this. Going to add my final keyframe, the bottom, copy this one, go to here, paste it in, use my arrow keys to move it with all of them selected. There we go. So I can hide my B. There's my A and my B. And I'm going to add with my morph selected at the top. I'll add my fill. And we'll do a soothing color. To pick. Nice pastel purple. Get this to view. And there's the beginning of our morph. And we're going to be fine tuning this Tuesday. Like I said, we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do with this new shape that's entering, how it's going to enter, when it's going to enter. And then we're going to add the 12 principles of animation to this, you know, easing our keyframes, using anticipation, doing overshoot. Follow through an overlapping action just to give more life to this. But already we've got a good start to it. So I'm going to hit save. And when we dive back into this lecture Tuesday, you could work off this file that I'm going to email everybody right now.